The purpose of this video is to provide you with rapid tips for how to navigate law and policy issues when you're scraping, archiving, or text mining third-party content, like social media posts, website text or images, or articles from databases. We expect you're watching this video because you want to scrape and archive digital content and use that content for text mining, or perhaps because you wish to scan and extract information from print or digital books. These research processes are referred to as text data mining or TDM. But we also expect that you're watching this because you have concerns about conducting TDM as a research methodology. Perhaps you worry that archiving or downloading materials violates the copyright of whoever owns the content. Perhaps you're worried about a database license agreement or a website's terms of use, which may expressly restrict downloading, scraping, and text mining. Or maybe you have questions about the privacy of the individuals and the materials you're collecting or any ethics associated with working with them. Today, we're going to briefly explain why and how you should consider each of these law and policy areas in archiving and text mining projects. And in the course of doing so, we will give you tips about navigating each issue. Quick disclaimer, we're not providing legal advice, but we're just seeking to help you make your own decisions about using and sharing materials based on a deeper understanding of the law and in accordance with your own risk tolerance. Of course, in a 15 minute video, we can't provide you with detailed information on each of these law and policy matters. So we'd like to direct you to a great resource, which is a whole set of short videos we've made about each of these issues. We've conveniently compiled playlists of the videos that cover each of these topics in a lot more depth, and we recommend checking them out if you really need help and support in designing or executing your archiving or TDM project. Okay, so first up, we'll talk about copyright and what you should know about it when doing archiving or text data mining. Throughout this video, we're going to start with the rules of thumb first and then explain how we got there. So the quick answer about copyright is, if you are downloading content from the internet, or a library database, or if you are scanning materials and using optical character recognition on them to perform your automated extractions for nonprofit educational research, all of this has been considered fair use, meaning it's a-okay to do it as far as copyright issues go, provided you don't break digital locks called technical pr protection measures or technological protection measures when doing so. However, it's critical to stress that there's a difference between downloading and collecting your content to use for your automated extractions and then republishing or circulating or sharing all of that same content with other researchers. The rule of thumb there is that when it comes to actually sharing the downloaded content you've collected with others, that's when you might hit the limit of what is considered fair use. So you need to think carefully about how much of what you're collecting you can republish or share with others. Now we'll explain what all of this means, beginning with demystifying copyright. To understand why it's okay to download or compile materials to conduct text data mining, but why it's not necessarily okay to republish or reshare everything you've collected, we first have to understand what copyright is. Copyright is a collection of rights given both to content creators, but also the public. These rights and exceptions or limitations are all set forth in what's called the US Code. And in the case of copyright, all of the laws are in Title 17 of the US Code. The very reason copyright laws exist is because the Constitution of the United States authorized US Congress to enact laws that would encourage people to create and write things. Specifically, the Constitution wanted Congress to promote progress in arts and science by rewarding authors with exclusive rights to their writings or art for a limited period of time. The Constitution told Congress to limit the length of time that these exclusive rights last because if they lasted indefinitely, this would cut against the competing goal of having the public be able to make use of the writings in order to continue advancing science and art. So at its core, copyright is really simple and can be thought of just as the exclusive rights that authors hold to their original works of expression with the understanding that these exclusive rights don't last forever to ensure that you can make use of the works too. So what are these exclusive rights that an author gets when they write or create something? Well, they're often referred to as a bundle of the following. First, reproduction. 
that means in the context of writing a book, if I'm the author, I'm the only one who can make copies of what I'm writing. Distribution. I'm also the only one who can distribute copies of my book. Derivative works. I'm the only one who can write a second edition or an adaptation of the book or turn it into a movie, all of which are considered derivative works. Public performance. With respect to public performance, I'm the only one who can read the book aloud to a, a public paying audience. And public display. I'm the only one who can take each page of the book and display it publicly for everyone to see. So if authors have these exclusive rights under copyright law, why did we say that text data mining is okay for you to do? Why is it okay for TDM researchers to scrape, download, reprodu reproduce, or publish work that's subject to copyright? The answer is that creating reproductions to conduct text data mining falls into an exception to these exclusive rights called fair use. And the main reason why text data mining fits within that fair use exception is because digitizing or reproducing content in order to extract data about that content is very transformative, which is an important consideration under the fair use balancing test. So let's dig into what fair use is and why US courts have determined that text data mining is both transformative and a fair use overall. Fair use is an exception built into the copyright statutes to encourage uses of copyrighted work in order to engage in criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research. So by its nature, it applies to the very kind of work that TDM scholars are doing in exposing relationships or information within or between materials. Section 107 of the US Code, Title 17, goes on to suggest four factors to be balanced when determining whether a use is fair. Factor one looks at why you're using the copyrighted content. Are you doing so in an educational context? And are you adding new insights or understandings? If so, then your use is more likely to be fair. And in the context of TDM, if you take a bunch of novels and digitize them or download, download social media posts to run algorithms on them that show how certain language is used, for example, then you are indeed adding new insights or understandings and transforming that text or content. So factor one leans in favor of TDM being a fair use. Factor two looks at whether the copyrighted work is factual and scholarly or more creative and expressive. The more factual the content is, the more fair it is to use it. Depending on what type of material you're using to conduct TDM, this factor could weigh in your favor or not text mining scholarly articles might be considered more fair than text mining images. But overall, this factor winds up being not very determinative for a court, though it does remain something to consider. Factor three looks at how much of the copyrighted work you're using. The less you use, the more fair your use is. Well, with TDM, often you're downloading or reproducing the entire work. So technically this factor would weigh against fair use, but it's important to understand that fair use is a balancing test and we are very strong under factor one with TDM. And we're also strong under factor four as I'm about to explain. Factor four considers whether your use supplants the sales or licensing market of the original. If what you're doing is extracting information from books or content already lawfully purchased or maybe you're downloading social media content made freely available online, you're not supplanting the market for the author or rights holder to sell more books or that freely available content. So factor four also weighs in favor of text data mining being a fair use. Therefore, on balance, text data mining is very strong with factors one and four. And as such, courts have determined that digitizing or downloading material to conduct TDM is a fair use overall. If you're interested in learning more about the court cases that have found TDM to be both transformative under factor one and a fair use overall, we encourage you to check them out. Two last copyright tips to keep in mind. Not everything is protected by copyright. So in some cases, you don't even need to worry about whether rep republication is fair use. Remember, we said that copyright lasts only a certain period of time. Well, after that time expires, the material is in the public domain, meaning not protected by copyright, and you don't have to worry about copyright anymore. 
In addition, federal government works are automatically in the public domain. Second, copyright protects creative expression, not facts. So for instance, researchers just seeking to download and mine information about statistics or citations, maybe mapping information about who gets cited and where or how, they're not using any content with expressive elements. That is the content they're using isn't protected by copyright to begin with because citations are just facts. So these researchers also don't have to worry about fair use or other copyright constraints when it comes to republishing that content. Now we'll turn to the next topic area, contracts. Just as we did with copyright law, we're going to start with the rule of thumb for contracts and then explain how we got there. And the takeaway we want you to have for contracts related to archiving and mining data is regardless of what's okay under copyright law, it doesn't necessarily mean you're free to download, create, and circulate your TDM corpus. Why? Because there may be a variety of different contracts that supersede what's allowed under copyright law. So we need to pay attention to contracts, including license agreements and terms of service, because regardless of whether TDM is fair use, or even if the content you're scraping and analyzing is in the public domain and not protected by copyright at all, there might be other agreements that restrict what you can do with the materials. So we'll now explain what those contracts are and what you should be aware of when reviewing them. One of the most common types of contracts that can affect what you are allowed to do with respect to TDM are a website's terms of use, sometimes also called its terms of service. For example, if you want to harvest user posts from Facebook for a project, Facebook's terms of service govern both how you're allowed to search Facebook and what you're allowed to download and do with the downloaded content. When you're working with social media or other websites to conduct TDM, you might want to be able to download a large portion of it or maybe even everything on the site. It's important to understand that doing so could violate the website's terms. The website's terms of use are considered browse wrap agreements, meaning that you consent to the terms simply by browsing or viewing the site. Take a look at the sample website terms on this slide. Here, the site owner wants you to get permission for re reproducing any images you download, even if doing so would be fair use. But it's also important to note that these kinds of browse wrap agreements are not always enforceable by a court. So what should you know as a general guideline? You should be aware that these terms may exist and you should make risk calculations accordingly. Often, if you're accessing publicly available content and downloading it just to scrape without breaking access barriers to get at the content, then it could potentially be a low risk to violate the terms because it may be hard for the content owner to prove damages. So the relevant question is, what did the website's owner suffer if it's publicly available content that was used for textual analysis? Maybe nothing, but that doesn't mean they won't try to sue. One good tip when reviewing website terms of service is to look for what's called a fair use savings clause. Now on the previous slide, the website wanted you to get permission from them to do any kind of reproduction of their content. Well, when we look at the terms of service on a different site, in this case here, the Museum of Modern Art, the terms provide that you can do whatever is considered fair use. And remember, as we learned in the earlier copyright segment of the video, text data mining is indeed a fair use. So by inference, the MoMA website is authoring TDM research, provided you stay within the bounds of fair use when doing it. In other words, the MoMA website terms save or preserve your fair use rights. Two more rules of thumb when considering contracts in your TDM project. First, if you're downloading or mining content from a library licensed database, what matters is not the generic terms of use you find online for that database, but the license agreement that the library actually signed with the database provider. You should contact the library to find out what that license agreement allows with respect to TDM. 
Often libraries will try to build fair use savings clauses into the agreements they sign with vendors. Second, even if the terms of use for the website or database restrict or prohibit text mining, the provider may offer an application programming interface or API with its own set of terms that allows scraping and TDM. If you're still out of luck, you could also try contacting the provider and requesting permission for the research that you want to do. Okay, we're moving on to considering privacy issues in archiving and TDM. Privacy law is pretty complex and is better treated in that series of videos we mentioned. But the most important takeaways for archiving and TDM are the following. Assuming you're not working on behalf of the government, the two main sources of privacy laws for you to consider when text data mining are federal statutes and state tort laws. There are many federal privacy statutes that control what data you're allowed to access and what you can do with it. For instance, there's the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, or FERPA, and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA. You'll of course need to comply with all relevant federal privacy statutes. But when you're dealing with mining data that is not covered by federal privacy statutes, you still need to think about state privacy laws or state privacy, privacy case law. State privacy laws are meant to protect against things like unlawful intrusion upon people's seclusion or public disclosure of embarrassing personal facts. But these state privacy laws have important exceptions that may permit you to conduct your research. So we're gonna focus on those important exceptions. First, the right of privacy is not violated by disclosures of matters of pu legitimate public interest. Additionally, specifically with respect to public disclosure of private facts, courts also have to balance a person's right to keep information private with your First Amendment right to disseminate information to the public. In achieving this balance, courts sometimes look to whether the facts you're seeking to disclose are of legitimate public concern or would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. Second, when a person dies, they lose the right of privacy, though not necessarily their commercial right of publicity as to their name or likeness. That depends on state statute. However, you're likely not doing your research for commercial gain anyway, so for all intents and purposes, if you're mining and disclosing information about people who are deceased, that would typically be protected by state or, or as opposed to federal privacy laws, then all of those state laws usually no longer apply because the person has died. Third, there are no privacy concerns if the people are not identifiable from the information you release. So if you anonymize the content, for instance. And fourth or final, and finally, if someone has released the information themselves, such as by posting the content voluntarily on social media sites or given you permission, they cannot sustain a privacy tort claim. Before we move on to the final topic area of ethics, we wanna point out that when you're collecting content that fits within a privacy exception that we just discussed, or if it's content that someone voluntarily disclosed, then you may not be violating someone's legal rights to privacy, but your actions might still have ethical implications. Ethical norms are not a matter of law in the United States, but may still be important for you to consider. So we'll talk about them next. Imagine in your social media archiving and text mining project, you are collecting social media posts from victims of domestic violence. There are no privacy concerns if the posters have voluntarily divulged information about themselves, but by collecting, analyzing, and resharing the content, you might be amplifying the posts related to domestic violence and making the victims, or perhaps the perpetrators, easier to find and potentially subjecting them to harm. Ethical rules that focus only on the characteristics of the data itself ignore the ethics of what we do with that data. So the question is, what responsibility should you take as a data collector and extractor in trying to anticipate and evaluate harm? As we mentioned, there are no legal answers to these ethical problems. All we can do is look for various types of guidance. 
As to that guidance, researchers often consider a wide range of sources and options, including developing agreed upon practices within a research group, consulting their research advisors, consulting journal publication guidelines, consulting professional association guidelines and best practices, undertaking engagement with the affected communities, particularly if the researchers wish to build long-term relationships with them, seeking institutional review board involvement or approval, even if none is technically required. Now, of course, getting IRB review and approval for research that ordinarily doesn't need approval can slow down the research process, not to mention overwhelm some IRB offices. So some fundamental structural changes at your institution might be needed if you want to go down that route. Finally, you could even think about adopting a specific ethics or privacy paradigm. Unless you adopt the strict do no harm approach, you may need to develop a balancing test that you like. Next up, we'll take a look at one example of a balancing test. If you are interested in considering specific ethics paradigms, we'd recommend our ethics video playlists for an overview of some of the leading theories. But briefly, we just want to highlight an offshoot of the framework called ethics of care because it might be of interest to you. An ethics of care model would consider impact on content creators or the subjects of the content you're using, infusing empathy and responsibility relative to any embedded power structures that affect the creators or the subjects. Essentially, what we choose to do as information collectors or analyzers will affect other people, particularly when people have less structural power. And according to the ethics of care, we should care about that. Through its focus on relationships, an ethics of care approach also enables a progression from accounting for the rights and obligations of individuals to the rights and obligations of groups. This means we can talk about not just an individual in a photograph, but about where and how, for example, Japanese American internment materials should be archived or algorithmically analyzed. The UC Berkeley Library has adopted a form of ethics of care in our approach to making decisions about what collection materials will digitize and put online. Our version of ethics of care is framed as a balancing principle. That is, we look to whether the value to researchers, the public, or cultural communities in digitizing and sharing the content outweighs the potential for harm or exploitation of people, resources, or knowledge. The balancing framework is just a suggestion and for your individual projects, you could consider whatever values you want to uphold, as well as any relevant community or disciplinary standards you wish to follow as you're developing and publishing digital projects. And it's a good idea to make these choices clear to your viewers and contributors. Let them know about the ethical considerations and how they are using and repurposing the data especially considering that it could be combined and displayed in ways not originally intended. So we hope this overview was helpful. If you're a UC Berkeley community member, we invite you to contact us with questions at the email address here. And our video playlists going into all of these issues in more detail are available to everyone on our YouTube channel, linked right from this slide.